All right, I, I think we just went live. Okay. Welcome to the program. You're all looking at my guest here, Steve Cohen. Is it Cohen or Cowan? Cowan. Cowan. All right, and St Steve is the director of a, of a media group called uh, Habitat Media here in town. You say you've been doing it for, what, 15 years, you mm -hmm. said, something yep. like that? since 92. Right, now, how'd you get into video? Before we get into your most recent video, which yeah. is the subject of the program here. Yeah, um, well, uh, long story short, I, I, I went into organic farming uh, in Northern California, and that sort of played itself out. And then I, I began writing, and I got involved with some environmental groups writing, and I, I sort of hooked up with uh, Friends of the Earth, David Brower. Oh yeah. Uh, and Dave, may he rest in peace. Yeah, he, may he rest in peace. He talked me into becoming a filmmaker, essentially. So I learned the craft and have been making docs ever since. Well, it's good. That leads right to what I wanted to ask, because I saw a couple of your other documentaries, or they've been on PBS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there was something about the oceans, I believe. Yeah, we've done a couple that be, that were uh, big hits in the PBS world. They were primetime specials, uh, what, basically looking at how the oceans are fished. And, and the sequel had to do with uh, growing fish, farming fish, because there's uh, potential there and a lot of problems. But uh, the, the, the first one was really about how the oceans are overfished and what's being done to, uh, to try to address that problem. Mm -hmm. Did you get into the genetic engineering of the fish or anything? We did. Because I did. know there's some, they're, they're asking for public comment. I forget which organization. On the salmon. In the agency. Yeah. But they're actually trying to bring the genetic engineering fish in as a drug rather than as a food. And that's how they're trying to get, yeah. they're trying to get it through. Yeah. You, can, you know, Monsanto is pretty slick. You know, they I, are. Well, I don't, I don't, is it Monsanto? I, I, well, maybe I'm, it isn't Monsanto. I, no, but. I think it's a different company. We actually ended up uh, interviewing their CEO. Uh, eight, I, I can't remember the name. But basically, the big concern that a lot, a lot of people have, a lot of marine biologists, is that the fish are supposed to be these giant so-called frankenfish that, that grow four times the size, uh, right. uh, or four times quicker than a, than a natural salmon. Uh, they're supposed to be engineered so they're sterile because the concern is is that the, if they start mating with the wild fish, they'll dilute the pool. They dilute and, the pool and they're yeah. dumbed down considerably, and so uh, they don't know how to escape predators or anything. And they're they're less healthy and can resist diseases probably. Right, right. and yeah. um, but it turns out that one percent um, are not sterile, and 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 at a lot of fish farms. Oftentimes, several thousand escape on a regular basis, and so if one percent, that ends up being a lot of fish. Mm -hmm. So it is a threat to, to wild salmon populations. Mm -hmm. So that we we covered that. Well, uh, what did you discover? When did did you already have an idea of what the issue was, or did you go into it just to? unfold it and see what it was about. You know, talking about the fishing of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. We we got um I was fortunate to have grown up my parents had a beach house. And so I end, I ended up being very you know close to the ocean and and I and I could just see in my own life and in where where I was on Monterey Bay in northern California. Oh, I've been there. That yeah. things were really changing. Um and um and I and it made me wonder all the birds were gone, a lot of the birds would come in after the fish and so uh, we started making a film essentially about where have all the fish gone locally. And then Tyson the, got them all. <laughs> <laughs> the deeper we got into it, the more we learned that we've, e we've eaten a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, and people think you can't fish out the oceans, but really uh, most of the fish in the ocean are along the coastline and fishermen know that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they've been, it's a big, <clears throat> The capacity of the fishing fleet has, and the technology, the fish finders and the hydraulics and everything, they've geared up to the point where the fish really don't have any place left to hide. And they've, they, they catch so many that they become these commercially extinct. Uh, and that's the case with tuna, with cod in, in New England. And so um, the deeper we got into the story, it took us eventually all over the world because the same story is happening everywhere, these serial depletions of fisheries. Um, so the trick, of course, is to start regulating fisheries in a smarter way rather than basically just say, well, it's the, the tragedy of the commons, um, that's the way it goes, uh, is to actually regulate the fisheries. And that's what they do up in Alaska, which is why their fisheries are in good shape. In spite of the oil, huh? <laughs> yeah, in spite of the oil. So uh, that story, um, it, it, it took us five years to make that film. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, uh, I wasn't necessarily going to move directly into what the next 
uh, documentary you're doing, but that was a perfect segue because we're, we're fishing out the seas, you know, we, we're destroying the environment in so many different ways. Why isn't that being changed? And I think the subject of your, of the, of the, the priceless is exactly why that's happening is because big money in politics. Right, and, sp and, and as far as segues go, we were, uh, you know, there's a big dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which is what got us starting to going on, on this other film, mm -hmm. um, that all the fishermen complain about. It's 700, 7,000 square miles uh, wow. beyond the horizon. Uh, no oxygen in the water. It's, it's, it's essentially a dead zone. There's nothing to catch there. And uh, we started asking around and found out that it happens every spring and it's from all of the uh, chemical fertilizer coming down the Mississippi River. Um, and getting pushed out to sea. That's right, and going out uh, into the Gulf. Um, and so we started thinking, well, why is that go on year after year after year? How come that doesn't get fixed, that problem? Mm -hmm. and, so that's what started getting, getting us into farming and, and our farm policy. We started looking at our farm policy and pretty soon we saw a, a film to be made. Um, you say, the way we like to say it is we ended up, <clears throat> it turns out a lot of environmental problems that we make films about uh, really get their start in, in the policy making realm in Washington, D.C. and so. Um, that's certainly the case with our the farm bill that's 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 passed every four years. It all it all it's it's made in Washington D.C. and we we started. That's one of the case studies of the film. Uh, and then we got into energy policy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not made in Washington D.C. It's it's made in a corporate boardrooms. I think is that's really right. what it gets down. That's to. right. But they're mm -hmm. represented quite well in in D.C. Government mm -hmm. relations. All corporations have government relations departments. Um, they all uh, they either have their own lobbyists in D.C full time or they they contract with hired gun lobbyists mm -hmm. and those lobbyists raise money for uh, members of Congress and members of Congress uh, are in a position where they they need to raise so much money to get reelected that they they're kind of in a bind they're in a tough spot because they they sort of have to turn to lobbyists to get the help to raise the money mm -hmm. so it, it made for quite an interesting uh, journey. Well, now you mentioned the word journey. I was just going to mention something like that. I mean, you started out in Monterey Bay and um, realizing that the fish were disappearing and then you go, you realize that it's a larger th situation and, and, and you keep tracking that, kicking out videos or documentaries as you go and, and it brings you to the place where you just finished it, which, which is the, the, the campaign cash that, that right. allows all that problem to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's not something you started out to do then. No, 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 we would, but we, we, it seemed to us, we could keep making documentaries about individual environmental problems, but uh, so many of them have their, their start in, uh, in state capitals or in, or in our nation's capital, that we thought it's time to make a documentary about that. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, you know, there, are, there is so many environmental problems, whether it be the, the state of our forests, whether it's what, five or six percent, 12 percent, I'm sure it's not 12, of our, of our ancient forests, right on down the line to, uh, you know, uh, mountaintop removal and coal. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there's been a lot of good videos. There's been good videos on food. I mean, the food mm -hmm. was one of them. King Corn right. was another one. Yep. There's been some great ones. Yep. And, uh, Food Inc., King Corn, um, we like to think that they didn't, that those produce great films, um, but they didn't really follow the money uh, so much. Mm -hmm. They just touched upon it. We really devote the entire segment to following agribusiness mm -hmm. cash. Well, that might be a good point. We got a little four and a half minute uh, teaser, as you call yeah. it. Uh, you say that this is this is not up on your website yet. This is no. just something brand new, right? And and it it it, uh, it has a glimpse of the farm story and our energy policy story. So it's a good it's a good little um, snippet. All right. So we'll go into that little four and a half minute piece. Then we'll come back. I think to be elected president these days is you need a lot of money. <laughs> money and publicity. A few thousand dollars? Maybe ten thousand dollars. After giving you money, people want you to do things for them. Millions of dollars. It has strings attached. And now you're going to have to pay it all off? And yeah, so that's a problem.
Americans love their country. We love it. But we seem to have less warm feelings towards our government. I think we're kind of losing the for the people of the people feel to it. I think that the come people's kind of been forgotten a little bit. We've lost that image that people get elected to serve the public. When you hear the word politician, what are the first three things that come to mind? You can imagine what the answers were, you know, dirtbag, money, corrupt. Every morning, every United States senator wakes up, and his first thought is, today I have to raise $20,000, or at the end of the next election cycle, I won't have a job. Who stops us from coming off oil to something else? The oil companies, why? They're getting rich. If money is free speech, that means that you who have a million dollars and I who have a hundred dollars are equal? Uh -uh. I like to eat, I like to eat. Follow us as we journey through America's pesticide-drenched farmland. If you had a bunch of people that say it's good to jump off of a cliff, I think they'd all jump off of a cliff. You know, and if they say use this chemical, this is good and this will do it, you know. But it all goes in one place into your wells, it goes down the rivers, and you're drinking water. We not only produce an abundant food supply, we produce a safe and affordable, the lowest per capita of any other developed nation. A number of our staff, including myself, are registered federal lobbyists. We'll organize a fundraiser for Member X. We operate a political action committee. We'll ask the various agricultural groups to make contributions. We try to earn a seat at the table. Blocking and tackling. If you're going to play in the game, you got to play by the rules. The hardcore work of lobbying. It's our system. We're all in this game that this is what we, they pay us for, so we do this. We would like to do the right thing, but we're certainly not subsidized to do the right thing. We've taken the culture out of agriculture. And through the smog-filled skies of our energy policy. I'm not sure that any one issue affects me more than, than our energy policy. Um, for the simple fact that it is so directly related to our national security and the lives of our, our men and women in the military. What we have in this country doesn't begin to resemble what you would actually sit down and design for a rational energy path. What we have in this country is a complete hodgepodge of special interests that politicians are afraid of offending and whose support they need to get reelected. You can check my records. I don't get a whole lot of money from any one special group other than the maritime industry. And I will say that because I am an only... We're not dealing with evil people, captain. but the reality is because they have to focus themselves on money, the system becomes corrupt. There's an ancient, ancient art form of that. It's called whoring and it is disgusting to watch. Money often serves as a proxy for support. Those with the most money, are the, well, they're really the people with the most public support. It is a part of my life every day. Every day I go make those calls. Money absolutely drives it. In a way, it's dysfunctional. Well, I don't pay too much attention to politicians. I'm not in denial of them at all. I know they exist. You don't ever get to really, like, get to know them. I want to be able to trust them. I mean, like, the rich people know them. I want a guy that's honest, and I don't want a guy that uses the same excuse that I'm going to lower taxes, because I've heard that way too much. Well, I know that it's a group of people who try to make things better. I mean, no one's perfect. Sometimes they don't succeed, but that's just my opinion. They don't make the best decisions, but sometimes they do. They do a lot up there. They everything a lot. They basically run our nation. All right, welcome back. That was that was great. So, did you interview all them, them children here in town? Some of them are here uh, at, at the Child Peace Montessori School uh, in the Outer Pearl, and but most of the kids we met were down in the Bay Area in Oakland, California, mm -hmm. at a couple at, and in Marin County. So there's like three or four schools down there. And we were amazed at how uh, astute these kids are, mm -hmm. because we just went in with our, we asked them all the same questions, um, and 
those are the kind of responses we got. It's interesting because, you know, they didn't have the details right, and, you know, $10,000 or whatever right. that kid said. But at the same right. time, they got an idea what the back of that tapestry looks like. Right. You know, yeah. as, as far yeah. as, you know, you, you need, what that fellow said, you need the promotion or, you know, you need mm -hmm. TV ads. I forget how they said That's it. That's right. But, but they're aware of all that. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, and and they're and it's sort of unfiltered. They're not afraid to say, "Hey, it just seems kind of fishy." Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, you, if, if you say that in Washington D.C., we found out it makes a lot of people very nervous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not that it's it's an issue. It's like the elephant in the room there. Um, By a lot of people, you mean congressmen? Or? Yeah, members of Congress. Members of Congress. Who, you know, we sat and taped interviews with a lot of them. Um, the film's full full of the interviews, um, and some of them, um, especially members of Congress that are no longer in Congress, that they're have retired. <laughs> so a lot of them are lobbyists, yeah. and some of them are, uh, they're ready to talk. They're, they're ready to, uh, they see what's going on, and so um, they were pretty frank about it. I think it was what, Grayson, what that fellow's name? And there was one one fellow there that uh, was talking about how how bad the money is. And you know, we've mm -hmm. always had folks like Ralph Nader, Dennis Kucinich, and folks mm -hmm. of that caliber that have talked about this for some time now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't seem to be any closer that to, to, to anything being done about it. In fact, it might even be further away. Right. Well, that's the thing, is that it's, it's, that's the whole thing of incumbency, is once they're in and they have their connections, their lobbyists who bundle money for them and uh, they, they've got their issues and stuff, they, they don't really want to change the system because they are at, at an advantage. When they have a challenger come, coming in, a, a, someone who wants to basically take their seat, they would be at a disadvantage to change the rules. And so there's a built-in resistance to change. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that resistance, and it's understandable that they would have it, but it seems, you know, uh, for example, the most recent election here in town, that the, the, the people seem to have a... a an anti-affinity towards that change. I mean, they, they mm -hmm. just voted out voter-owned elections, mm -hmm. and right. uh, w which would have been, you know, uh, the, uh, the the city ponying up a certain amount of money, and uh, once, once the once the candidates met certain requirements, and uh, that would have taken a lot of money out of the election. Uh, how do you explain that? I mean, yeah, you know, I, I've talked to some of the folks that organized that whole measure, and their sense is that. You know, the Oregonian came out against it, mm -hmm. uh, which raises some questions. Why would the Oregonian come out against something? Uh, or why would the Oregonian uh, be silent about the fact that uh, the money really, the, 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 it cost Portlanders 68, they figure 68 cents per Portlander mm -hmm. um, for a system that allows people to run for office without having to be either wealthy or having their hands in someone's pocket uh, to get elected. And so it's going to go back now to how it was, um, which is too bad. But um, the, the folks that have organized the measures, their, 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 their sense seems to be that um, given that the Oregonian took the stance they did, which is a kind of a head scratcher, um, and the fact that a lot of people, this is something that we've encountered in making this film. We've been all across the country. I mean, we've been in the suburbs where people are putting groceries into their car at markets. Uh, we've been on, on both coasts. We've been in the farm, in the heartland. Um, a lot of people are just so busy just trying to make ends meet that they just don't have time to follow what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And so they're ready to believe what they hear. You know, ads that say that... Um, that a for instance, voter-owned elections is a waste of taxpayer money. Uh, it's a good soundbite. Uh, apparently, the money that would that, that paid for Portland's uh, voter-owned election didn't didn't take dime one from schools or kids mm -hmm. or firemen or, or police. Um, it was capped at I think two tenths of a percent of the city's general fund, and they never even reached they never even reached that cap. And so. Um, there were certain groups that were out to get it, the Portland Business Alliance, right. um, and that the, the, if you look at what business or, uh, businesses are involved, that, that they and I think that what is it, the Metro, I'm probably going to get this wrong, the Metro Association of Real Estate Realtors, or there's certain groups that were really out to, to kill that uh, measure. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, like you say, people are so busy, they don't have time, they just they just live their life on that thin veneer of 30-second sound bites. 
they're too busy to dig into the th and, and make acknowledge yeah. the fact the, use the critical thinking that of course the Oregonian would be against it and the and the and, and the uh, television stations because they're the ones that's getting the majority of that money yeah well it um, doesn't take a lot of critical the, thought the, the, to, the, the, <laughs> the people that we've met just average citizens they know something's wrong but we would ask them we 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 call them sidewalk interviews there's a lot of them in our film where we would ask someone so how do you feel do you feel represented we go to fourth of, we went to a lot of fourth of july parades this oh, film is idea. five years in the making mm -hmm. and we, i said what are we celebrating uh and they would say well we're, we're celebrating our freedom our, our great democracy our independence from from a monarchy and so on and I said, well, do you feel like we really have? Is that democracy uh, alive mm -hmm. and well? Do you feel represented? Mm -hmm. And at least 90% of the people we asked that question would just laugh or, <laughs> or say something really cynical. Mm -hmm. um, and they know there's something wrong. My follow-up question would usually be, well, what, what is it? What, what, what do you think? What, where exactly are we losing it? And I heard everything. We heard everything under the sun. Uh, and there's a lot of confusion out there is what we realized. And so part of the reason for making Priceless is we wanted to show exactly where we're losing it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's really what the documentary is. It's not so much an expose because what, we're, what is in the film is happening every single day right out in the open in Washington, D.C. And in, in, and in Salem, you know, state capitals. Basically, lawmakers depend on lobbyists and special interests for their campaign money. It's the lifeblood for their reelection. And so they're in a situation where they're pretty much forced to turn to those guys. And mm -hmm. we have another clip that we can play. We spent some time in Arizona, which is, they had their version of voter-owned elections. They still have it, um, which is statewide. Uh, as opposed to just the city. That's what got Napolitano as governor, I believe. That's right. She ran as a clean candidate. Um, and so we spent uh, two or three election cycles in Arizona sort of uh, giving, getting, documenting uh, how things work there, uh, how it is to run clean versus not clean. They call it running clean if you run on public funding as opposed to special interest money mm -hmm. there. And so... Um, it's a big. It's a. It's a great part of our film that that shows that it actually works. Um, uh, it just as it could have worked in Portland and and was working. It was working. It's just it hasn't <clears throat> didn't get a chance. Does uh, d does the whole state there of Arizona allow folks to not opt out for that, or does everybody have to do it? No, it's optional. It's, it's optional. totally optional. Just like it was here. That's right. It's optional, and uh, it didn't come out of it. Individual taxpayers didn't pay a dime for it. It came out of uh, money levied on tax, uh, cr petty crime, uh, traffic tickets. That's that's where the money came from, mm -hmm. um, and, and it continues to come from. So it's, it's uh, people like it. it they, they don't try to repeal it there because people would never... Uh, go for it. Was, was that the uh, product of an initiative? It was. Uh, oh, it was a referendum, a statewide uh, so uh, it initiative, wasn't, it wasn't ballot initiative. It wasn't brought up by the, by right. the Congress there. Right. Um, but, but just as in Portland, there are some vested interests that try to kill it every year, mm -hmm. and they get closer and closer, uh, but they, they haven't succeeded yet. Um, but it is an optional system, and so we spent time with <clears throat> lawmakers who run conventionally, running on private money, special interest money, uh, and, and, and candidates that run on, on the public fund there. And what a contrast. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear in the film. Okay, well, since you brought that up, that we have that segment, that eight and a half minute segment mm -hmm. of the, of the uh, voter-owned elections. They probably don't call it that there, but it amounts the to the same. Clean, clean elections there in Arizona. And we'll go to that eight minute clip and then we'll come back. Is it just too tough to change the way things are? Are elected representatives having to play ball with big money sponsors? It's become as routine and acceptable as Arizona's annual softball game between lobbyists and legislators. If you slid into home plate, and you're waiting for the call and you hand the umpire a thousand dollars, that would be considered a bribe. Your bill's dead, your bill's dead. But if you kind of sneak up to a politician at a fundraiser and give him a thousand dollars, that's called a contribution.
There's nothing wrong with lobbyists. The problem is the connection between lobbyists and money. And the only way to break that connection is by going to public financing of all congressional and Senate campaigns. We'd heard about a don't tread on me attitude in the Grand Canyon State and their road testing of a new kind of electoral reform. So we thought we'd have a look. The people that are being elected to office kind of lose sight of the fact that uh, most of the people in this area are moderate income people. And it doesn't seem to be fair that uh, the large corporations are deciding who our uh, representatives are going to be. If the Founding Fathers saw what was taking place right now, they'd roll over in their graves. I can't give them money. I can give them $10 out of my paycheck once. Do they care? No. Power corrupts absolutely in the end. I mean, the money comes in and the game starts changing. People with their Blackberries talking to somebody, I think I could maybe hit on this guy. Should I go after him or wait a minute, here comes somebody else. After having to stomach a series of political scandals in the early 90s, Arizonans got fed up and changed the way they run their elections. Public funding helped me get my start. It really did. You, you don't owe any favors to anybody. No one raised money for you. And so uh, you, you, just, you just vote how you want to vote. Your hands, your ears, your eyes, your everything else are not tied up by special interest groups. And you're really a free agent. You're a free agent to represent those that were your true stakeholders that brought you here. Those are the ones that you are to answer to, period. You know, I, I spent a lot of time with lobbyists. That's because I was a chairman. I was the Ways and Means chairman, so that's like an important role that a lot of money, a lot of money, and lobbyists want to mess with the tax code. Going to dinners on a regular basis, hanging out. But that totally disconnects you from your voters. No, it gives me more time to focus on fundraising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or. Arizona and Maine are two states where most of their office holders can say they won office without having to cozy up to big money sponsors something they call running clean. How are you? I'm Kirsten Cinema. I'm one of your state representatives, and I'm your neighbor. So I'm running as a clean elections candidate. Candidates can run for public office and not take any money from uh, corporations or special interest groups or even spend any of their own money. But in order to qualify, I have to collect about 270 of these. I raise five dollars from 250 people and I submit it and then the state funds my campaign. I don't have to raise money from private industry at all. That way I don't have lobbyists breathing down my throat. Like trial, trial It's important to know that Clean Elections takes no money from the general tax revenues the state receives. The primary funding source for Clean Elections is a surcharge on fines and penalties. Basically, if you commit a crime or get a traffic ticket, there's a surcharge that will be used to fund Clean Elections. Well, do you mind, do you have a problem with them videoing? It's... We tagged along with a few candidates for Arizona's House and Senate, who instead of power lunching with the executive crowd in downtown Phoenix, tend to spend time in their own districts and neighborhoods talking to fellow citizens. Here in Arizona, I know we asked for a $5 contribution, and so my theme has been for many years, give me five. And so my constituents are used to that. It really brings out a lot of conversation with them. As a teacher, I had seen that kids don't have everything that they need, and I wanted to try to make a difference. Then I thought, I could do this. I live here too. I have a say. I vote. Why not? Why not me? You are here with your walking shoes on. It's not set up to where you can have these big glamorous gatherings and parties and ballrooms. That's not what it's all about. It's about getting out there and beating the pavement. It opens the playing field up. This is what I love to do. I love talking to people. I love being real, sharing my thoughts. Sometimes they change my thoughts, you know. Sometimes they tell me something that I didn't think about. It is a wonderful way to campaign without having to spend your time asking rich people for money. It's a way of campaigning that's optional, and yet it's elected more than half of Arizona's legislature, plus their governor, secretary of state, and their attorney general. But there are still those writing and voting on bills who raise money the usual way and plenty of lobbyists ready to help them. This plaza uh, between the Senate and the House building is the busiest place in the neighborhood. It's filled with lobbyists, absolutely filled. There are deals being made here, there are deals being made there. We actually have a much greater number of lobbyists than the 90 legislators here. 
if it wasn't for clean elections, I'd probably be worried about, you know, uh, you know, oh no, if I voted this way, they're not going to give me the money I need. It gives me a chance to run without relying on lobbyists, without relying on special interests. I'm not going to owe anybody anything but the voters of District 17. Are you registered to vote? Could it really be this simple? Politicians who no longer need big money sponsors to fund their campaigns? It seemed too simple. So we thought we'd visit a couple of groups closer to downtown that have tried to repeal Arizona's clean election law. Taxpayer financed campaigns, rather than enhancing uh, freedom of speech, actually work to stifle speech in the marketplace of ideas. Money often serves as a proxy for support. Those with the most money, are, well, they're really the people with the most public support. They've been able to go out and convince the electorate, A, to donate money to them, and B, to support them. So I, I don't think that's necessarily a negative trade. All I need is a solid gold Cadillac. We thought it interesting that efforts to repeal the state's clean election law have not only all failed, but they've been funded largely by donors with ample resources, many of whom tend to bankroll local politicians. Folks who simply like the system the way it used to be. Well, with clean elections, you no longer need that money and you're no longer beholden to those business interests. You can vote your conscience. There's actually a live phone bank going on right now. If you want to go inside, two phones left. So why does public funding and those who run on it tend to be so popular in states like Arizona and Maine? She's been trying to get all the corporations to face what they need to do to clean up their acts. And in order to do that, you can't take their money. Citizens in this community actually trust her, so they're willing to support her all the way. When you're a, a new legislator and you're establishing you know, your voting record, I think you really weigh carefully, hey, how's this going to impact my, my funding if you're running traditional? If you're publicly financed, uh, I don't think you give it a second thought. Rich works diligently to find out how all the constituents feel. He can represent the people and not individual industry. I never get the sense that she has all sorts of lobbyists around her telling her what to do. Some politicians will say one thing and then th throughout the course of their term they've completely gone in a different direction and she's really stayed true. It's hard to stay that way. I mean I tell people I wake up every morning and do like the political whore check. Am I a political whore? Am I doing what I believe in? Am I being true to myself? Or am I doing something for other reasons? And this is like small time cake stuff here, not anything compared to what's happening in Congress. But we just don't, the system, I think, encourages you. What happened there? That was the end of it there? Yeah. Oh, OK, yep. great. Yep. Ca caught yep. us all by surprise yep. there. Boy, you know, I don't know where to begin with it. That uh, Arizona, you say, is one of what, three states Mm -hmm. Connecticut and, and Maine, right. and I imagine the story would be the same there. That yeah, yeah, we, we didn't spend a, t a lot of time, but they have their stories of basically we're supposed to have a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, and so there are people in the Maine legislature that are single uh, parents, uh, in one case a waitress uh, who felt strong about a, a lot of issues. Um, things are changing in Maine. Mm -hmm. And I was, was thinking about this recently because so much of this, the voter-owned elections, what came to me it was his image of uh, uh, Lucy's football meeting good cop, bad cop. It just seems to me that, uh, like that woman said, say one thing and then they change course. Mm -hmm. It's just like they put that thing out there and they get everybody believing them. And uh, along with people being so busy and they can't dig into things, uh, they don't have any sense of history. They don't realize, well, you know, year after year, election after election, they tell us these things and then after they're elected, nothing happens. Right. You know, it just goes on and on that way, year after year, election mm -hmm. after election. Right. Yeah, and so we wanted to figure out why does it does it does it why does it keep going on and on, and does it really have to? And you know, I I think after documenting these these public funding approaches, I think it can change, and I think it could work on a federal level. It's just a matter of getting Congress to go for it, and that's a t that's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Real challenge. You know, like the other half of that, uh, Lucy's football is the is the good cop, bad cop. I mean, you know, what first you got the Democrats in it, and the Republicans are the bad guys, and then and, you know, mm -hmm. and then it just flips. Yeah. And uh, there's no sense of history that they go back. You know, uh, you want to start talking about free trade, and went back to Clinton, and it's it, it doesn't matter who's in office. 
these issues just they just continue no matter whether it's a Democrat or Republican. It just seems like there's just two puppets there. Well, the average cost of winning a house uh, a seat in the House is 1.3 million. The average cost of of getting into the Senate is now uh, almost up to eight. A million bucks. Is that some of the new numbers you said that you? Yeah, were, right. Um, yeah, I'd be interested in hearing some of those. It up, yeah. up from was it? It's, it, it's not doubled, but it it's up. It's up thirty percent from 30%. from two years ago, from two years. This this last election that just ended on the second uh, uh, is uh, the cost is up thirty percent from and 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 the, and in two thousand eight it was up a similar number from two thousand and six, so it's skyrocketing um, and and it's. You know, we, we spend a lot of time with, with various members of Congress, and you can feel the panic. Um, you can feel th they have to leave their office uh, every single day to go dial, dial for bucks. Um, it, there's a group called MapLite. A lot of these statistics about where this money comes from. MapLite? MapLite. Uh, MapLite.org. Uh, if, if you go on the, on the website, they're easy to find. They're a group that takes some of the statistics that's made available um, from another group called uh, OpenSecrets.org is a great website. Uh, Open Secrets, I've heard Open of that Secrets. one, yeah. Uh, and they, all, their information all comes from the FEC uh, or from the I and the IRS and from the clerk of the, the House and the, and the um, uh, Secretary of the Senate. It's all public information put out uh, on Open Secrets. They're a nonpartisan group that has this information. Everyone has access to it, but few people actually go there. Uh, but it's really amazing to go to those because they actually show you for every member of Congress where their money is coming from. This group, MapLite, actually thought, okay, well, their money is coming from these various industries. Is it influencing how they vote? So MapLite has taken it uh, another step, and they've actually uh, f uh, published reports that are on their website. One thing they looked at, that well, one of their reports has shown that uh, these are new numbers. Um, members of Congress, uh, no, this is just the House between. 2005 and 2007, they had to raise $700 million uh, campaign funds. $551 million of, of that amount, which is 80%, 79%, came from outside their districts. So they went and, and they were able to, through zip codes to figure out where the money's coming from. And f most of it's coming from Washington, D.C., which is basically the political action committees and from lobbyists. So, if we are supposed to have a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, and these legislators have to scramble to raise millions of dollars, and most of the money is coming from Washington, D.C., we really have, we don't have a government of the people, for the people, by the people any longer, you know. Not unless, it, not unless it, the, the people are sending these, these PACs and these lobbyists a couple bucks. You know that's not well, the case, though. Where's, well, the, where's the money coming the, from that's going to Washington D.C.? Well, here again, you know, they, they've, there's the, the, the data shows that less than two percent of Americans give more than two hundred dollars to a candidate per election cycle. Um, if you do the math, it's basically that it's average people just don't have that kind of disposable cash of the sort these legislators need. They have to turn to special interests. They have to go to deep pockets. Um, mm -hmm. And they can't do it in their own districts, their, their own neighborhoods. They have to go to Washington, D.C. for the money. And these, these political action committees, these PACs and these lobbyists represent a, really just a few big industries um, that have enormous amounts of money it's they can just they can throw money that they're not afraid to spend millions and millions in campaign contributions because they get policies that earn them billions so it's a real good investment for them I mean it looks it sounds like big money 700 million just for the house over two years but the oil and gas industry a lot of these industries they make so much they're making record profits and so they get that much in tax breaks that's part of what a subsidy is, is a tax break. Sure. Yeah, it, uh, it just seems to me that, you know, you hear about the money coming from out of state. I think it was either the, it might have been Dino Rossi's campaign up there, $45 right. million dollars came in from out of state. So what you're saying was, 
was probably from D.C. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, those are, uh, this, this 2010 election is a new creature and a scary one because, you know, there was a, uh, a recent Supreme Court decision, uh, Citizens United versus the FEC, Federal Election uh, Commission, um, and basically a majority of justices on the Supreme Court basically removed the ban, uh, all, any ban, any limit on campaign funding. And, and, and now, like Rossi, the, he got a lot of money through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, I believe. Mm. And that money uh, is anonymous money. They don't have to divulge the source of any of that money. And, I mean, just think about it. I think, I think $123 million was funneled to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. They won't say who it comes from. Who has that kind of money? It's got to be large corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and actually, they've, they found out that a lot of these are transnational corporations. Some of this money is coming from overseas. It's not even from the mm -hmm. United States. That's, that Rossi could be have gotten some of that money. I'm not saying he did, but he very mm -hmm. well may have. We don't know. He may not know. He just know it came. It came from the chamber. The chamber's not saying. Sure, or could, could, couldn't from come from the Koch brothers. That's right, know, or Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Um, Incredible amount of money. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's, it's and it's all legal. Yeah. That's what's so amazing, and and um, that's why uh, uh, a voter-owned election. That whole concept. I, I think people are going to hear more and more about it because really, if we don't have an alternative. Um, I think we're, our democracy is in deep, deep trouble. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to get a state that, uh, that has a little bit more clout than Arizona to, to maybe to take it on because uh, no one ever hears about what Arizona or Maine mm -hmm. or Connecticut are doing. Mm -hmm. Not enough population, I suppose. Well, there. there's actually a bill that's up that, that uh, um, is not, hasn't passed the House. And with this recent election, it's... Uh, it's hard to say what's going to happen to that bill, but it's called the Fair Election Now Act. Right, right. And it would create something similar to what Arizona has uh, and what Portland had uh, on the federal level. And um, uh, I think they had a, more than 100 members, House members, signed on to that bill because they are, a lot of them are just fed up of the money chase. Is they it, are is fed it, up. Is it both sides or is it just Both the sides Democrats? of the aisle. No, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's bipartisan support for this bill. Um, but given the fact that a lot of newcomers to Congress who have just recently been elected, in many cases with campaign money from the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine them supporting yeah, the Fair yeah. Election Now Act. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's another thing that worries me and it worries a lot of people. And I think the more the information gets out, um, I think the more people come to realize that we better come up with a way, an alternative to that kind of funding. Mm -hmm. You know, as we've been talking, uh, especially at the very beginning, you know, you talked about the energy companies and, and, and all the ones that are behind this. Uh, you have any idea where you're going to go to next? And to me, it seems like the next big step following the path that you've been on is to do something about the media, the next document that you do, documentary. Well, you know, you, it, you know, part of the Fair Election Now Act, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, Jim, because part of the, the Fair Election uh, Now Act, the money that would actually pay for, the, for what would be essentially a public fund and uh, an alternative so that members of Congress could run on this money instead of special interest money, it doesn't come from individual taxpayers. Part of it comes, would come from the licensing of our airways. So mm. a lot of this money is going for TV ads. And it's, it's being run on airwaves that we, the people, own. Um, and so part of what would fund this fund would be the, the uh, licensing of our public airwaves. Well, you know, it's, it's nice to think that they're public, but uh, they not really, we don't really have a lot to say about them, actually. You know, I think that the corporations, whether they're, um, they're TV or radio, are supposed to... Uh, provide public uh, programming that, that, that means something to people and they get their, li well, they get their license every five years or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just, just a rubber stamp, mm -hmm. it seems like. They're not, really, they're not really being held to that. Right. No, I think it would be a good documentary. 
Maybe you should make. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the experience yeah. or the time. Apparently, uh, well, I think you do. Yeah. But it's hard to raise money for those things. Um, yeah. really, really hard to raise money. I think that's the biggest challenge facing me, anyway, and a lot of my friends who, who make films like this, is that raising money for it is really tough, especially with what's going on with the economy right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, how do you raise money? We've uh, we've been fortunate. Uh, we've we've had foundations have, have come ah. um, a few individual donors, but mostly pub, uh, private foundations, big ones like uh, Packard, uh, MacArthur um, have come through for us. But their money is tightened up too, uh, and so that's a, a real challenge for. For yeah, independent since, filmmakers. The, since the I, I've known even some some 501c3s have kind of done social justice or environmental work that kind of went under when the foundation mm -hmm. started drying mm -hmm. up, and uh, so that that would that would make a big difference with with yeah. video uh, projects as well. Mm -hmm. So but that would seem to me the next the next step because uh, actually it was uh, a local woman Barbara Dudley gave a mm -hmm. talk a while back. She's professor adjunct professor at PSU in political science, and she was. Uh, something that I've been kind of saying all along and uh, she has a lot lot more knowledge than I and she says most of this money is going to the media they're the ones that are the driver mm -hmm. of this right, right, and right. Uh, there's fairness and accuracy in reporting fair.org and they have a, they have a magazine that comes out every month there I think it's every month now and mm -hmm. they just trace mm -hmm. what's going on with uh, not the money but but what's going on with uh, like on a TV program uh, a news program they'll have somebody from the center and somebody from the right can call the person from the center a left and so they're they're really skewing things, right, you know, right. and and uh, there's so much of that that needs to be brought out. Although, like you say, if folks don't take the time to listen and pay any attention to nothing but the sound bites, mm -hmm. you right. know, and they're, we're not bringing our children up to think critically in school and ask questions. I don't, phew, boy, it's it's. Well, in our film, there's a lot of kids that do think critically. So there, I think there's hope. I mean, I was surprised actually, Jim, that that, that kids. Uh, a lot of them are really aware that something's fishy going on. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think there's hope there. Um, on, you know, our film, we're, we, we've, we're pitching it around, we're shopping it around to various broadcast venues, um, uh, independent lens at POVs, uh, considering it at this time. But PBS, their budgets are, have shrunk, and so just to promote a film like ours, uh, takes uh, takes another for a national promotion campaign mm. another hundred thousand or so it's, so uh, we're we're, yeah. we're maybe faced with having to raise more money to get this film uh, out and mm -hmm. um, people can learn more about the film at our website at www.habitatmedia.org all right and and I think that has been up there a few times right. well while we're mentioning it I know that uh, I think we can uh, put the graphic down for a minute and put, I think we have a graphic for a showing of, of priceless that's going to happen the 16th right. at the first Unitarian Church I right. think that our graphic person worked this up uh, November showing, yeah, AFD. Well, for more information, maybe she doesn't have the information. But yeah, as, you, as you were saying, it was the 16th. That's right. It's the 16th at 7 o'clock at the Elliott uh, Chapel um, of the First Unitarian Church. That's the 1200th block, I think, of... of uh I forget the address. I think it was, tw think it was 1200 of, of, yeah. uh, of 12th Street. But Alliance for Democracy is hosting it. You can go to their website, their website. Um, and we'll have it up on ours as okay. well. And, and, uh, and it will be showing the whole Yeah, the, the whole, whole film will show. Um, it's, uh, these were just snippets, but uh, the film actually, uh, it's, it takes you on a journey that, that makes some sense. And I, there has been a lot of talk about this, you know, every election this comes around. And one thing they were talking about today is, I guess, because of Sarah Palin and her, and her big grizzly ad or whatever that was. Uh, yeah. They, they're saying that the actual the election is, is starting for 2012 is actually kicking off right now, mm -hmm. right. which means, you know, how much more money is that going to be? I mean, it, it seems like it's going to break all records again. It's it's. Uh it's it's a runaway situation. It really is. It, we got to get a grip on it. Or I think it's, um, I don't know how long people can keep lighting sparklers on the 4th of July with the way things are going on. The way things on. are going, yeah. yeah. And, in, and uh, as you said, you, you, uh, wh where did you get the idea to go to the 4th of July parade uh, You know, that? we that were at one. In fact, in, fact in, in the film, uh, we, we went to several. Uh, we went to one uh, here in Oregon. We went to the one in Canby where you saw, uh, uh, I guess, Miss Oregon. We had a, we taped a short interview with Miss Oregon. Um, mm -hmm. She was waving, sitting in a convertible, and uh, I went over and just asked her for, on a lark uh, what, what, 
what she feels like is most worth celebrating on the 4th of July. And it really surprised to surprised me to hear what she said, uh, which is in the film, which is, uh, it was a bit of a surprise. Mm -hmm. She was great. She was great. She was really feeling like basically average citizens um, don't count for much anymore. Uh, and Unless you're Joe the plumber. That's right. <laughs> you're Joe. Um, but uh, she was great. But yeah, Fourth of July, uh, it just struck us uh, because of our, a lot of these sidewalk interviews that Fourth of July is a good place to talk to people about our democracy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, talking a little bit about your, your organization, I mean, you, you, you are doing this work. Uh, you have 15, 20 people working for you? Oh, yeah, 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 we have yeah. a vast studio office yeah. complex uh, <laughs> in the Outer Pearl. No, it's usually, we, sh we, we, we at the height of production, mm -hmm. uh, we, we can be up to uh, maybe eight people. Mm -hmm. um, but then in betwixt and between, we shrink down to a couple of us. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're a, we're a nonprofit. Um, contributions are tax exempt. Mm -hmm. So it's good yeah. to get that out there as yep. well. Yep. So, uh, we're going to put that phone number up. Uh, we we lost it there for a second because of the uh, the information we were wanting to get out about the the showing of the First Unitarian Church, and uh, wouldn't mind talking a little bit about uh, you're you're talking about doing one on Zoo. Yeah, I think that's something you're actually in production, or no, you, you're just doing no. storyboards it, for. It's sort of storyboard. We're in we're in early pre-production, sort of the embryonic beginnings of that one. Um, we're trying to. Uh, it, we're trying to figure out whether it's doable from a funding point of view, um, and we're starting. It's so we're sort of feeling, it, putting a lot of probes out there to potential mm -hmm. funders and so on. But basically, what the film is about is there's an extinction crisis going on. We're sort of going back to what we usually do. We go back to environmental issues and we'll leave the political stuff behind for a little bit. But uh, it always gets political, though. But yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's good to make that circle. That's true. But there's an extinction crisis, which I'm sure you guys are aware of here, that's going on. Um, and a lot of it is just really comes down to it isn't just population growth. It has to do with the way development uh, continues all, worldwide. And consumption. And so loss of wild habitat means uh, these these critters have nowhere else to go, uh, but uh, away. Uh, and in some cases, it's it's forever. And so, we're looking at that crisis, uh, and th sort of through the prism of zoos, because zoos, like the Oregon Zoo here in Portland, they let you know uh, that various species are endangered, and they show you where in the world they they come from. Uh, but there's not a lot of information about why uh, they're disappearing. Um, they, they might mention its lack of, of loss of habitat, but why is that? Um, and so this film, uh, we're going to get into what, why is it? Where is all this uh, habitat going? Does it really have to be that way? Um, and so uh, it's, it, it will take us to places where a lot of zoo animals are from. Some of them are from North America, but a lot of them are from Africa and Asia. So we're going to go to... Uh, a couple of sites where there are large preserves, uh, eco parks, uh, which is really the, the last hope for saving some of these um, wild populations of, of tigers and a lot of other animals, uh, elephants. Um, and zoos uh, are doing a lot to, uh, are contributing a lot of not just money, but a lot of uh, scientific expertise to make these uh, eco parks successful. So it's sort of, we're looking at uh, what zoos are doing about the problem rather than just um, talking about endangered species. Uh, as, as the extinction crisis goes on, I, we can keep talking about it, but uh, it, it's actually doing something about it is what we're more interested in with this film. Mm -hmm. And zoos are starting to get involved. A lot of people go to zoos and they love seeing the animals and sometimes it's sort of depressing because it, these animals look pretty bored and uh, being confined and so on. But it's good to remember, we're, we've just realized that zoos are also doing a lot of positive things too. So it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a uh, It's interesting to bring there. the other side on there. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. I saw something interesting. We were down to about four minutes here. I saw something interesting that there's a large uh, market in uh, forget how they called it wild meat or jungle meat or right. whatever bush meat bush meat that was the yeah. one so you, you're familiar with that a little oh, bit yeah then. yeah and a lot of what zoos and these preserves these big eco parks they do two things they they 
try to help local communities develop economically without having to go and poach these animals, you know, because there's a huge under, uh, black market trade in all sorts of exotic animal parts. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and Aphrodisiacs. If, that's and right. A lot of different things. Right, yeah. right, all sorts of things, medicinal in China mm -hmm. and Asia and, and, and everywhere, really. But um, if someone can go w with a, an AK-47 and, and uh, in the space of 30 seconds kill a, 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 an elephant and cut and the chainsaw its ivory tusks off, um, they're set for the next, uh, their family might be set for the next couple of years. And so a lot of what zoos and other groups are doing, it's not just zoos, zoos are participating, are they're trying to create ways for <clears throat> humans that live in the vicinity of where wild animals still roam, a way for them to make a living without having to go into the whole poaching thing or to be cutting the trees or destroying the product, uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the habitat. Or grow opium poppies in, in, in the, Whatever the it Mideast is. or right. cocaine in, in right. South America or yeah. Central America. It's the same thing, sure. They, they, they have to be, a lot of these folks probably don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I forget what program it was that I saw, but uh, they're going out there and they're shooting uh, these different animals. I mean, everything from gorillas to mm -hmm. whatever. And then the, the, there's a market for this meat, not just locally either. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. shipped all over the world. Yeah. A lot of these problems seem overwhelming, whether it's campaign finance or what's going on with this extinction crisis or with the ocean. But what we've one thing I positive thing in making these films I've learned is that they're not they they are solvable. And there's a lot of positive stories about where they're actually things are turning around. And so that's the that's the plus side. Uh, filmmaking doesn't pay a lot of money, but we get exposed to a lot of positive stories um, and see where things don't have to go down this inexorable track of of uh, destruction. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I do in this program. I, I run across and meet a lot of people, and you know, every week that I interview people such as yourself, it's people doing things. Yeah. You know, it isn't just like people are throwing up their hands and walking away and saying, "Oh, woe is us." Right. You know, there's some of that going on, but at the same time, there's an mm -hmm. incredible amount of work being done, and, and video is just mm -hmm. one of them. Yep. And, yeah. uh, and so you you have went through the whole thing with we got about a minute left. You sh you went through and sh the show you did on oceans. You showed those and you got that on onto PBS. And right. now you're going through the same thing with That's right. with, with this priceless. Right, right, right. And, and in each case of our films, we we sort of showcase what's what successful what's going on to actually turn it around and so public funded elections is something that's really working in the united states it's been road tested it could work nationally portland might have voted it down but it's, it, i think nationally it's it's day is coming um, the oceans demand for environment friendly seafood has changed the way um, u.s fisheries operate so uh... things aren't a bygone Foregone conclusion. Foregone conclusion. I think we might yeah. have to give the foregone conclusion because I think we're down to about 30 seconds. Right. Is that is that so? And we got two different. We got two clocks there, and they don't say the same thing. Right. So I think we're down to it. But right. I sure appreciate you coming on and talking. I about appreciate this. you having me on. I'm really glad you're doing this show. All right. And there's a, there's a lot to be learned out there, and we all can make a difference, you know. We, we just can't get bummed out how bad things are because underneath it, things are, things are getting better. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.